And first of all, welcome everyone to coming along to our um, exclusive baking session with Penny Melville Brown. Uh, this will be our fourth session we've done. So, oh my goodness, there I am. Um, <laughs> this is our fourth <laughs> session we've done, um, and everyone seems to be really enjoying these sessions and joining in. That you get a chance to bake along with Pe Penny or sit and just listen and find out um, different techniques. So. Um, as it's um, national, no, it's not. It is World Baking Day today. You will have to excuse me. I'm reading from a screen that I'm normally using uh, speech on. Um, so that's very low. So I'm just trying to read from my screen. So it is World Baking Day today. We will be doing more sessions like these. So please stay with us um, and, and register with us. But I'm going to hand you over to the lovely Penny um, who's going to take you through today's recipe. So make sure you've got all your ingredients ready if you're baking along. And this is being recorded. So if you don't want to appear on the screen, please turn your screen off. Um, but I'll hand it over to you, Penny. Thank you very much, Zoe. And good morning, everybody. And I'm sure you're all waving and saying hello back, but I can't see or hear you. Um, we're going to start right away. And in a little saucepan, you need to put your 100 grams of water and your 90 grams of lard. And I know some people are trying it with butter or other fats. And that needs to go straight onto the cooker, onto the hob. And we need to melt it very gently and not get it to a boil. We just want this the fat melted. So I'm going to pop that straight on the cooker now. Next thing you need to do is make sure your oven is on at gas mark six, which I think is um, 200. 200 degrees Celsius. OK, and the very next thing you're going to need is a bowl of hot soapy water for washing your hands because it is going to be quite messy later on. OK, now then, here I have my bowl. And in this bowl, I have 200 grams of plain flour, 50 grams of strong white bread flour. And that's because the strong white bread flour is going to have a bit more gluten in it than the plain flour. And that will make the pastry slightly more robust, slightly stronger. I've got 50 grams of um, butter, which has been in here for a while, so it's softened up. Um, I've got a teaspoonful of salt, and if you've got it, a teaspoonful of ground mace. And ground mace is really quite important because it gives you all the flavor that you associate with pork pie pastry. So all I've got to do now, Lord. all I've got to do now is just rub the butter into the flour, just as if you were making um, a short crust pastry. So I'm lifting it up, I'm getting a bit of air into it, just dissipating the butter through the flour. And you can see this is going to take me, oh, seconds, minutes, just rubbing it through. And as I'm standing here, I can smell this mace coming up from the bowl and it smells delicious. Mace is the outside of nutmeg and it tends to be really rock hard if you get a whole nutmeg with still with its mace cover on it. But they take it off and turn it into a separate um, spice, which is mace. And you can get um, pieces of mace or ground. And that is about done in my bowl. All right, I'm just going to rinse my hands. OK, coming back to the cooker. I'm just going to see. Aha! Right. I'm going to switch this off. I'm a blind person, so I'm allowed to do this. What I've done is put my finger into this pan, which are clean because I've just washed them. And my bit of lard is just about melted in this water. 
I'm just encouraging it with a bit of a squash. The whole point is I don't want this to get too, too, too hot because it's going to make all the pastry quite difficult to handle later on. So mar lard melted. Just finishing it off. And you could feel it too, but be really careful with this. I'm sure all the health and safety people would say, do not, as a blind person, put your hand into a pan of hot water and fat. But then again, I'm a cook and I'm allowed to do things like this. So all of that lard is now melted. So I've got a sort of slightly hotter than you could bear bit of water and lard. That is going, making a well with my left hand in the bowl and pouring the lard straight in. Bloop, like that. And this is our pastry nearly made. Got both hands in there. I said I'll use a wooden spoon, but um, actually I'm trying to keep down the washing up. So there is my pastry. And I tend to use my hand rather like a claw. So I'm not getting the pastry into the very center into the palm of my hand. I'm just using a claw of fingertips to bring it all together. And you will look at that and you will think, oh my goodness, that is just a yucky, sloppy paste. And yes, it may be, but it's got lots of potential. The fridge, I've already got a plate and I should have told you this earlier. Um, you want a, a cold plate in the fridge. And I'm going to take this gloopy mess of pastry, put it on this cold plate, spread it out to make just a disc. All I'm trying to do is cool it down quite quickly. So that pastry is spread out on the, on the cold plate. And that is going to be whacked into the fridge to cool while I prepare the filling. I'm that wasn't too difficult, was it? And all these people say, oh, pastry is so hard. I can never do pastry. My hands are too hot. My hands are too cold. Well, actually, you can. Now, in the fridge, I have a bowl of um, sausage meat. And this is where we are going to prepare the filling. Now, I'm just using really basic sausage meat that I get from my butcher because I know he makes it himself. And I'm just scrabbling up this sausage meat and mixing it in. I put in here, in the bottom of the bowl, the zest of a lemon. And that's simply because sausage meat is quite fatty and a bit of lemon will just cut through the fat. And then I've got here a little ramekin with some fresh thyme leaves, as much or as little as you like. Bang that in, squidge it in. And you can see this is one of those really tactile cooking recipes that is great for people who can't see because we're feeling everything we do. I'm going to put in a jolly good grind of black pepper. I use one of these electric pepper mills because it means I can hold the bowl or the plate so I know what I'm peppering. Otherwise, I can sit there and grind pepper straight onto a tablecloth. OK. So that is a filling. Now, you could do all sorts of different things with this. Now, often I would be using very small pieces of um, chicken perhaps that I just soaked in a little marinated, in a little lemon juice. I might use some cooked ham. I might use small pieces of turkey, um, anything you like. Often you would make a raised game pie. So I would be using pheasant, partridge, venison, rabbit, all sorts of different sorts of meat. Um, the key thing is that actually, particularly with a game pie, all that game is quite um, fat free meat and you because it's cooking for a while you need to have the fat from the sausage meat 
just to lubricate it all. So if I was making a game pie, I would put a layer of sausage meat at the, at the bottom of the pie. I'd put another layer on the top and I might put another layer in the middle and then just put my game, my rabbit, my venison, whatever, um, in layers around it. And often the traditional way would be to put it in layers so that you put it. So when you cut it, you've got all this nice stripy filling to show to people. Vegetable fillings. The other thing I might do is put, um, I don't know whether you've seen them, they're called stock pots. And if they're good enough for um, that French chef, they're good enough for me. Uh, Pierre White, whatever his name is, Mar Marco Pierre White. Um, and so I might sort of squidge one of those into my sausage meat. It just adds an extra dimension of flavour. But you do have to be careful with those because obviously they've got quite a bit of salt in them. And I'm just standing here chatting a bit now because I'm waiting for one, you to catch up if you're cooking along with me. And two, for that pastry to cool down a bit because I'm about to get it out and have a look and see whether we can start moulding it. Let's think about what we're going to put these um, little pies into. Now, if you've got a metal baking tray, um, like a bun tray, that's perfect. What I've got here are some little foil dishes. And when I was very young, we used to get custard tarts in these. So they've got quite um, tall and straight uh, sides to them that come up to give you a bit of a pork pie sort of feel to them. And because I didn't know what sort of tins you might be baking in, we're just going to be quite careful um, about the filling because we don't know how much pastry will make how many pies. Um, I would make as many as I can. And actually, these pies freeze really well. Now, here comes my pastry. And it's much cooler. And this is going to be like Play-Doh. And so I'm taking a sort of handful of it. And I'm rolling it into a ball and you can do it, but you can use a rolling pin and all the rest of it. But actually, who wants all that extra washing up? So I popped a ball into the bottom of my metal foil container and I'm simply using my fingers to squidge that ball around the bottom to cover the bottom. And I'm squidging it up the sides I'm getting it right into the corners and what I'm trying to do is make sure that it's not too thick and this is the joy with this sort of pastry you can mold it as thin as you possibly can because of course that cuts down calories so it's better for you but it also makes it go further I would think with these little tins that I'm using today, I will probably make about three of them. And if you've got fresh sausage meat, you could freeze these, wrap them up in plastic bags or something, and you could freeze these um, and then you defrost them and then cook them once they're defrosted. So I will, you know, I would freeze these, put them in the freezer, um, defrost them overnight and then come back and um, pop them in the oven and cook them just as we're going to do today. But I wouldn't do that with sausage meat that I that has already been frozen. So I have now gently moulded out from about a quarter of my pastry my first lining of my little dish and I know that it's probably not hugely helpful to show you but I will just in case anyone has enough vision to see that and there it is so you've got a little foil tin full of very thin pastry and I'm now going to do another one 
And don't forget, as you do this and you use up your pastry, you're going to need some to make a lid. So don't go mad and fill up all your pie tins and then think, oh, what do I put on top? I think just for today, I'm only going to make a couple just to show you. The joy of this pastry is that you can bung it in a plastic bag and throw it in the fridge and then you could come back and make some more tomorrow. It's very forgiving pastry. All you need to do if you do that is to just let it come up to room temperature so that it's malleable again and you can form it into your pork pies. So I don't know whether you've ever had a pork pie straight out of the oven. They are absolutely delicious. If you were wanting to have them cold later on, then I would be making up a little bit of jellified stock. So I might use one of those stock pots. I might use put a little bit of wine in it, um, a couple of leaves of gelatin, um, some water and just turn it into a nice stock that will set and you pour that into the pies once they've cooked and that's a real test for you as to how well you've made these pork pies as to whether it all pours out the bottom because you've left a hole in it so i'm happy that that's a second one done so now i'm going to get my filling i'm going to make a ball of that i've got about whew, probably a third of it in my hand and i'm making a ball of it I'm just going to see whether that's going to be enough to go into one of my pies. Yeah, that's not bad. If you want to put jelly in it, you, it's really good to put a finger hole right down the middle of your filling now, because you're going to need some space to get that gelatin in later on. And here's my second one. That's another third. So I think you're going to make possibly three, possibly four of these little pies. Here's, I've lost my other. There it is. In goes my filling into the second one. And actually, I think rather than be lazy, I am going to make a third one because then I can cook them all together. Now, if you're feeling your pastry, I hope you're feeling that it is starting to firm up as you go along, um, as it sits on your plate cooling. It is much easier once it's chilled. I have a very nice game pie tin, which is one of those sort of oval pointed at the end shapes that all clips together. And many is the time I have sat there with this pastry, which I haven't allowed to cool sufficiently. And it sort of, you push it up the sides of the tins with your fingers, and then it all sort of shuffles down again, like sort of droopy knickers. And um, I have to keep doing it. It takes me about half an hour, so it's much better just to chill the pastry first. You can see how quick it is. And who needs a rolling pin and all the flour and all the mess? when you can just do it as simply and as quickly as this. And that is my third one done. Last of my filling, roll it into a ball, plop it in, put a fingerprint down the middle so I can get something in if I want to. Now, my last task is to put the lids on these. So I've got some pastry left on my plate and I'm actually gonna be a bit disciplined now and spread it in, divide it into three portions, because I know that's the amount I need. So again, just like Play-Doh, I'm rolling it between my palms to make a ball. I'm then pressing it out between my fingertips, my thumbs and fingers, to make a sort of loose shape that's semi, sort of like a circle, but probably not really. And then I've got my first pie. I'm going to just 
see if I've got it wide enough to go over the top of it. And there it goes. There's that first covering on. And what I'm doing is I'm pressing it to join around the edge of the pie. And I'm just easing it out with my thumb so that it actually meets all the way around the pie. If you've got too much, you can just trim it off and reuse it. But that gives me, I think, what we would call an artisan finish. I, it's not perfect like you get in a shop, but it's pretty neat. And I'm putting my finger back down through the middle into that finger hole I made before, because that's going to let any steam escape. And there's the first one. Here's my next ball. Rolled, pressed out. Here it comes. And again, just watch what you're doing here, because do you remember you made the sides of the pie really quite um, thin? So don't go mad with a very thick topping. And if necessary, just push it out, as I'm doing now, and take off the excess so that you haven't got really heavy lid and very thin sides. You just want the pastry to be fairly balanced. Right, there we go. Last one. So these are all my little scraps of pastry. Now I've got sort of like a loose misshapen pancake. And it's going to go onto my last. Pie. Pressing it out. And I am going to have enough a little bit left over, but I don't really have a use for that. What I have got in the fridge is some extra sausage meat. So I might make some more pork pies tomorrow. So I might keep this little tiny scrap of pastry just to add to that. And that's how forgiving this pastry is. So if you were wanting to make pork pies, you could make your pastry the day before and just lob it in the fridge. Put it in a plastic bag. I find plastic bags so much easier than cling film, which for blind people is a bit of a nightmare. OK. OK, I've got a little baking tin here. So I'm going to put my three pies on it. One, two, three. I'm just going to find my egg, egg wash. And you're absolutely right about the egg wash. I made these the other day and got complaints that it was all a bit pale and not very inspiring, which for blind people doesn't matter so much, but for our sorted, sighted gourmets, they want something a bit specialer. So I'm just brushing them with a beaten egg. I use a mug when I'm doing my eggs because it's much more stable than a little plastic bowl. Into the oven, Gas mark six for 10 minutes, and then we'll turn it down. Alexa, set timer, 10 minutes. There you go. Starting now. Super, thank you ever so much, Penny. We can um, go to some questions now, if you like. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to unmute yourself. Um, and Could you keep them up? Hi Penny, it's Jeff, Jeff and Hillary. Hi, Jeff. We've not put them in the oven yet. Um, do I need to make a little hole in the top to let the steam out? Absolutely. And if you are going to put some jelly in later on, you want to make a big hole. Okay. So I, I'm going to use a forefinger and push it in, but not through the bottom. Thank you. Alexa, set timer for 10 minutes. <coughs> 10 minutes, starting now. 10 minutes, starting now. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> That's why I unplugged my one before we start. <laughs> yeah. Love it, do you? Zoe, I, I use butter for mine. We can't get hot as Oh, excellent, Louise. How, how did it go? Um, it took, because well, I, I tried it out a little bit earlier, so my oven, um, and it 
cooked. They seem to be taking a little, a long while to cook. <laughs> the pastry right. was, quite, was quite sticky, but the fridge bit, that really, really worked. Um, yes. I was Excellent. With butter, should we put less water in? I, I think, yes, I, I would be um, tempted to. It depends what sort of butter you've got. If it's unsalted or concentrated butter, yeah, I did, I did use unsalted. Yes, then that has less water in it, but salted butter will have, I think, more water. So therefore, you either use the same amount of butter and just throw another handful of flour in, or just cut down the butter. Actually, I think put some more flour in it and, you know, enjoy the butter. <laughs> hey, it's Hilary. Can I ask a question, please? Yes. Um, I got the mace off my spice rack and just out of interest, I asked Jeff to check the date on it. It's about five yeah. years out of date. So Alexa said that I could use um, cinnamon or ginger or grated nutmeg um, in a combination as a substitute. I've done that. Will that noticeably change the flavour? Um, it will. Um, if you, the cinnamon and the ginger will change it, but you know that's how people invent new recipes. Yes. So yes. Just enjoy it. Yeah. Um, I, I do. Think, uh, hopefully, and I'm only saying hopefully, <laughs> in the of base um, around because I do use it all the time, and I will use it in this. But I might also use it in Christmas cooking. You know, as you would with nutmeg and cinnamon and ginger and all the rest of it, mm. when you're making Christmas mincemeat, Christmas puddings, Christmas cakes, then a bit of mace doesn't go on this either. And it does have okay. heavy in other savoury dishes. Mm, fine. Penny, it's Kath here. Can I ask a question, please, about yes, your please. pepper grinder? Um, yes. It's, it, does it... Uh, grind at various grades. Can you change it from a fine to a rough? I've looked at these when I've seen there them in the fine. in the catalogues, but never actually ordered one. And I thought, no, let's have a look. Let's see, there are two little screws, and you need a a, a tiny uh, Phillips screwdriver, and okay. one's got a plus, and one's got a minus on it. Right. Okay. So you can that will, that tells me that you can adjust it, the, the grade. The okay. The Thank you, sir. Yeah. Brilliant question. Right. Penny, it's Jeff again. Hello, Jeff. It's not a question. It's just an observation that um, I really enjoy the tactile feeling of the pastry, and you know, it's... takes me back, takes me back <coughs> to my play doh days. It's very satisfying. Uh, it is. <laughs> now we, we've done it perhaps in foil cases or bun tins, and as I said, you can do it in a great big um, sort of oval but pointy. I, I'm sure it's got some geometric shape. Um, tin which clips at the end um, but you know I've also made um, used th this pastry to make like like little flans like um, quiches um, so I, I haven't put a lid on but obviously you need to put the filling in which could be a vegetable filling or whatever and perhaps um, a little bit of um, an egg custard bit of egg beaten up with a bit of creme fraiche yogurt or cream mm. and it like little um, tartlets. Um, so it, it's a really clever pastry. Um, I hope when it comes out, if you've got it thin enough, you'll feel that it's quite crisp. So, um, um, and today we've put mace in, into it to flavour it and a bit of salt, but there's absolutely no reason why you couldn't put a little bit of sugar in it and make a sweet pastry. So you could make Ooh. an apple pie with this. Oh, but yes. just put just watch how much liquid you're putting into it because um, you, we, we don't want it to be soggy on its bottom, you know, and we know that Mary Berry is a... Definitely don't want soggy bottoms, no. no. Oh. <laughs> did anyone try a different filling to what Penny did today? I did um, minced beef. Oh. Um, and I added in onion mushrooms and I didn't have any time, so I put tarragon. So yeah. that'll, that'll change the flavour slightly. <laughs> yes. But I put slightly less, I had slightly less mince, um, mince in because I was adding in the other bit. Oh, right. there you go, someone's done. Alexa, stop. Alexa, stop. 
Oh, I can just imagine what all your houses smell like. They've been baking along. Mm -hmm. Alexa, timer, 20 minutes. I also have in the oven, so I'm trying to be economic. Second timer. Gone off yet. Starting now. I've got a rhubarb and ginger crumble cooking for lunch. Oh, I'll be round in a minute, Penny. My favourite. <laughs> <laughs> so this is fr too. fresh rhubarb and it's crystallised ginger that I get in packs from, is it called grape tree? Grape tree. Grape tree. Um, which I use all the time in cooking, actually. Um, so chop up the rhubarb, chop up a bit of a handful or two of um, the, the crystallised ginger, and then my famous crumble topping, which is made with oats and brown Alexa, sugar stop. and butter. Alexa, Alexa stop. stop. Oats, brown sugar, <laughs> butter, and... Um, Oh, crushed hazelnuts. Oh. Hello, Gary. How are you? You've forgotten something in your crumble. Oh, you want whiskey and stuff in it, don't you? <laughs> Gary. <laughs> <laughs> Gary and I cooked once, and he wanted raisins, I think, soaked in whiskey with oh. apple. Oh, in whiskey. And I did, wow. I did it with rum, didn't I? Yes. <laughs> well, that's good. Just... Just just about finishing the book. And so your roadkill is in the book. Whether oh, it ever gets published is another whole matter. But um, if we can find a publisher, we will get it published. Fantastic. Uh, so I, I made a big pie rather than individual pies in a Victoria sponge tin, that sort of size. Yep. How yep. long should I put it in the first time and the second time, please? It's, on, it's in for 20 minutes now. On gas mark six or gas mark two? Gas mark six, the 180 fan. Yeah, I would leave that in there for at least 20 minutes before you turn yeah. it down. Yeah. Okay, and then do do how long for the second lot? Um, really, I think you're looking... What What is your filling? Is yours a vegetable filling or a meat filling? Yes, it's got vegetarian sausages, chopped up, uh, mushrooms, carrots, they're all... Ooh. Oh, yeah, right. exactly. and, and lemon zest and thyme, obviously. Were, were your lovely. vegetables pre-cooked? Sorry? Were your vegetables pre-cooked? Yes. I would give it at least 20 minutes at the lower temperature, if not 30, and I okay. would be prepared to put a piece of foil over the top just mm -hmm. to um, stop it getting too brown. Does anybody, if we do some more baking sessions... Does anybody have any suggestions about what we might make? So I've got a couple up my sleeve, but we'll see how we go. I must be honest, Penny, the, the ginger cake, uh, it takes takes longer to make than it does to cook. It's cooked in the microwave for nine minutes. And, um, yeah, you just beat the living daylights out of it, really. <laughs> there you go. Why don't we try that one day? I love ginger <laughs> cake. Yes, it is. <laughs> And I wondered if you would like to try making shortbread one day. Oh, yes. I'd be well up for that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's quite and I'll one. tell you what I did is I made millionaire shortbread. Oh, I love millionaire shortbread. That is the sort of thing that you don't bother to eat. You just plaster straight onto your hips. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Or your stomach if you're a man. Yeah. And the oh, other well, one... I thought we might try is perhaps you should make some scones. You've got gingerbread, well, the ginger cake, um, some scones, some shortbread. Yeah. And we, shortbread is easier, as complicated, and the scones <laughs> are equal. When I was in Australia, I was taught this recipe for, they call them lemonade scones. <gasps> oh, that's nice. With some flour, cream, and a bottle or a can Fizzy lemonade. Oh, oh, um, oh wow. Yeah, we might be <laughs> in their version of the WI, which is the country women's association. Yeah. And you can use any sort of um, sparkling liquid. So I have seen it made with just sparkling water. 
Mm -hmm. I have to do with ginger with, beer. <laughs> yes, ginger <laughs> beer. You could make it with Fanta. Coke. You could make it with Coca Cola. <laughs> I've made it. Wait for it. I've made it with sparkling wine. Ooh. 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 <laughs> now, how many people were actually making these pies today? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Chris? I had intended to, but I forgot to take the meat out before I <laughs> said. Oh, bless you, Carol. Oh, nice. Have a very bad morning. I just <laughs> <laughs> And we've got oh, right. um, 16 people with us today. That's including, obviously, me and you, Penny. Um, so yeah. it sounds like three or four maybe have uh, been baking. I know Hilary was baking along with Jeff. So maybe yes. four or five were baking along with yeah. you. Yeah. Ah, right. Oh, yeah. well, let's, what I'm going to do now is take these out of the oven. Um, so they've been in there for 20 minutes at Gas Mark 2. I'm going to, one, get Alan the sous chef to come and have a look but I'm also going to get him to check the internal temperature because I know with meat um, if you're in a restaurant they would be trying to get it up to 75 degrees centigrade um, Heston Blumenthal might serve it at 65 I think a middle position of 70 degrees centigrade makes me confident that this meat will be cooked thank <laughs> Alan, can you bring them up? Can we get them so they can match? Yeah, Mine are done. Mine are done. They, they are way over 70, so happily done. Are they looking brown and lovely? Yes, they are. They are. Oh, can you see them? Yeah, no, you can't. Just... I'm blind. I don't know why I'm asking you. <laughs> no, I can't see them. <laughs> I mean... Okay. Alan, That's describe them. Well, they're... Um, yeah, uh, they're a lovely golden brown. They look perfectly yeah. cool. Yeah. Um, Yummy. Yes, do I have uh, yeah. We know what you're having for lunch today, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> Two for penny, one for me. That's a normal. <laughs> <laughs> they look a nice golden colour. And we will have that with a little winter salad made of finely sliced. Um, Celery, pepper, spring onion, tomato, mushroom, carrot, courgette, nice. a bit of salad dressing, handful of toasted pumpkin seeds, handful of raisins. Yummy. Mm. Uh, can I put them down now, Zoe, if you take a Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That if you want to join these sessions, you do need to either register on a, on our Eventbrite, so you yeah. make sure you get your ingredient list and um, the emails to remind you of the event and also the direct Zoom uh, link. If you have problem right. registering on our Eventbrite, please contact Open Site, and we will obviously uh, get you on the list for you. Okay, so but. Thank we will you. see you all, if you can make it, next <laughs> month for our next delicious recipe. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks. 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 Thanks.